Assalamu alaikum ayyuha sayyidat wa sada Shalom haverim wa haverot This be upon you ladies and gentlemen My name is Samir Bitar I have the honor and privilege to serve as chair and moderator for this morning panel I would like to start by thanking all of you for being with us and for your support Before we begin this presentation is part of the 13th annual International Conference on Central and Southwest Asia I would like to thank the Central and Southwest Asian Studies Center, especially all my colleagues and staff, the Montana World Affairs Council, the UM Department of History, the Department of Modern and Classical Languages and Literatures, the Russian Studies Program. I would also like to extend thanks to the President's Office and the Office of the Provost at the University of Montana, as well as the Rocky Mountain Ballet Theater for sponsoring and organizing this conference. Of course, a special thanks goes to the members of the Greater Mozilla community, as well as the faculty, students, and staff at the University of Montana, who have supported the organizers of this conference with their deep commitment to bringing discussion and important and critical international issues to this campus and community. <coughs> Today we have a distinguished speaker, Dr. Andrew C. Long. Andrew earned his BA in English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University and his PhD in Comparative Literature from the Graduate Center in New York City. He has taught writing and composition as well as undergraduate and graduate courses on various topics in literature, cultural studies, in media studies at Hunter College, the American University of Beirut, and at the Claremont Colleges. In addition to his work at KGI, he is currently an adjunct professor in the Department of Cultural Studies at the Claremont Graduate University. I, on a personal level, I'm very happy to have Andrew with us today. Uh, yesterday, we had the honor of hosting him in Arabic class, and Although I just uh, met him, as I listened to him share his experience in Beirut, I felt I know him from a long time ago. Uh, Andrew has received research grants from the Hewell Foundation and the Huntington Library. His recent book publication, as I hold it up, is titled Reading Arabia, British Orientalism in the Ages of Mass Publication. 1880 to 1930. He also has written in many peer journals. I will share with you a few art, uh, uh, titles. From Childhood Memories to the 1960s Politics, Recent Translations of Work by Mahmoud Said, Redemption in Jeddah, Fantasy and the Arab Western Encounter in Text and Image, the Hidden and the Visible in British Orientalism, colon, the case of Lawrence of Arabia. With no further ado, please help me give our distinguished lecturer, guest, a Montana welcome, please. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, good. So uh, when Professor Kia uh, contacted me and asked me to you know, be involved in the conference, um, <clears throat> towards the end of the conversation, he said, and uh, well, your panel is just you, uh, and it's an hour and a half. <laughs> and, uh, 
uh, that really goes against everything I, I, I like to do, and certainly in an academic life. Um, I always tell the grad students, you know, really never speak for more than 20 minutes. Make sure you have a good image and a good joke. Uh, and here I am. I'm going to be responsible for an hour and a half. And I, I, uh, this is pretty daunting, and I'm really concerned that some of you might fall asleep. Uh, please don't. I mean, I, I think I have something uh, interesting to share with you today. Uh, I guess which leads me to my sort of second preliminary comment, which is um, much of this material is, uh, well, how to put it nicely, uh, uh, very quick reviews of some novels which you've probably never heard of, uh, you'll probably never think about again, but I think they're important. Um, so sort of bear with me. I do have some pictures to sort of literally illustrate what the novels are about. They'll give you an idea. Um, but uh, yeah, again, I, 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 I I, I'm concerned that I'll be sort of jabbering and giving you plot reviews for an hour and a half, or at least an hour. Um, so bear with me. I, 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 again, I do think that, I'm, that the point that I'm trying to make uh, is important. Um, also, just in case sort of the, the idea gets lost over the next hour and a bit, uh, my point's really just this, that uh, in the 1880 period, through the 1930s at least, I would say as the, the Lawrence cult starts to sort of ostensibly tail off and Lawrence himself dies, uh, there uh, is intertwined with uh, not just uh, a British culture, but I would say a British everyday life in the broadest sense, um, a mass-produced Orientalist fantasy. This fantasy is literary in its basis. It is the word, the written word, the printed word, the mass-produced printed word. Um, and I think it, it not just is a, a part of the culture, a part of everyday life of uh, well, modern 20th century Britain, but um, importantly, it serves what I call a sort of, uh, to borrow, it's a, an unfortunate word from uh, Slavoj Žižek, but it's a, a kind of a prophylactic, it's a sealing or even a masking function uh, with regard to, uh, uh, shall we say, some of the contradictions, the ideological contradictions which uh, underpin uh, the uh, 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 Britain and the British Empire in the period. Uh, I'll try to elaborate this perhaps with a, a sh very short clip from uh, uh, the Sheikh, starring Rudolf Valentino. Some of you have probably seen this. Um, and uh, maybe it'll, that point will be a little bit clearer. Now, this idea, this again, and this prophylactic function, as I called it, uh, I think really uh, 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 holds sway until about the 1980s. And uh, it's in the 1980s that I think that the pressures of immigration, as well as the change of politics, the collapse of the, not the collapse, but the erosion of the appeal and the organizational function of the old British left uh, changes things. Uh, uh, and there are a number of books, which I'll get to in the second part of the, uh, of the talk, uh, which I think are exemplary in, in uh, uh, sort of pointing to the, again, A, the collapse of the, uh, uh, of the, the prophylactic function, but uh, what replaces it? And I call this a kind of a, a taking the fantasy for reality. Uh, so if at first the fantasy functioned in this uh, sort of masking or prophylactic way, in the second instance after the 1880s, the problem is some of these writers who we, we know, I mean, you, uh, you've all heard of Salman Rushdie, for example, um, Martin Amos, Ian McEwan, I mean, these, some of these are great writers. I quite like Ian McEwan's work. Uh, but in, uh, I'll try to elaborate, but I think that they, they uh, shall we say, take the Orientalist fantasy for reality. Um, uh, and one of, their, uh, one of their crew, you also probably know, Christopher Hitchens, uh, really went, uh, before his passing away, uh, really went overboard uh, with a campaign against what he called Islamofascism. So um, this uh, paper is about uh, Islam and the place of uh, Orientalism in British life uh, to this very moment. And I do think that uh, uh, given the, uh, the global economy, given new media, that this, these ideas are not just a British issue, but very much an American issue, as we certainly know from the news this morning. Okay. The title of my talk today, Tales of Saladin, is easily explained. In the 19th century, there was a good deal of interest in the Crusades, as some of you might know from reading Walter Scott's novels such as Ivanhoe and the Talisman. Does anybody read Walter Scott anymore? I don't know. I did as a kid. But, um, in particular, a cult developed around two figures, Richard Coeur de Lyon, or King Richard I, the Lionhearted, and his Middle Eastern, albeit Kurdish, counterpart, Saladin, or his full name was Saladin ibn Yusuf Ayyub. 
I think this was a cult and a pairing of characters which survived well and would still make for a good populist film about the Crusades for a Western audience, of course. Uh, though there actually is a Saladin uh, uh, Arab film. Um, he's still a, a cult figure. On the other hand, at the end of the uh, 20th century, we have another Saladin, specifically Saladin Shamsha, or Saladin the Todi. That is the meaning of his name in Urdu. One of the two protagonists of Salman Rushdie's most controversial novel, The Satanic Verses. My objectives today are easily, also easily explained as I want to trace, albeit roughly, the representation of Islam, specifically Muslims in the Arab world, in British literature from the late 19th through the 20th century. I'll focus on examples from the 1880 to 1930 period and then from our own time, that is at least from the uh, uh, 1988 publication of the Satanic Verses to the Charlie Hebdo murders, uh, bringing us up to, up to date. I have some reason for this emphasis in periodization, which fits with my other points. Now, anyone with a moderate knowledge of British literature knows that Islam and sectarian representations of the Prophet are everywhere in Chaucer, Spencer, through the 18th century. You really can't teach British literature without some sort of anti-Islamic slur, uh, alas. Um, however, I argue that it's with the 19th century, for the most part, the literary engagement with Islam is rooted in the specifics of colonial struggles, particularly in the Sudan, and is not then again about Islam as such in the older sectarian tradition. So it's this tradition, which I'll, I'll, I'll outline here with reference to the Sudan War, that's the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan War, desert romances, which spun out of that, and also the rise of British Islam, and offer examples from the last two decades then of the 20th century as a break and counterpoint which informs where we are today. Also, an important point here, it's literature, mass-produced Orientalist literature, is a feature of modern British and American and European culture, and the related fantasy of the Orient is a constitutive fantasy. Now, in the introduction to Alain Gros Richard's monumental book, The Sultan's Court, Inladen Dollar offers the most pithy definition of fantasy as understood in psychoanalysis and with reference to the fantasy of the Oriental despot. First, this fantasy, as Gros Richard argues, is widespread in the West and is the kernel of much Enlightenment thought, particularly that of Montesquieu. Still, what interests both the commentator and writer is the enjoyment factor. The sultan in question is certainly a figure of arbitrary power, but most of all, a despot of enjoyment who consumes and even wastes an endless flow of desirables, whether women, food, art, or, do, or his domains. The sultan of the Enlightenment has much in common, as we you know, obviously see, with early European uh, medieval sectarian representations of the prophet. The flow is one way, for he is strictly obeyed by his subjects. Right, think of the recent uh, book, uh, the French novel, uh, Submission, our sort of fascination with this idea. We'll hear more about Submission later on, I think, this afternoon. Um, for he's strictly obeyed by his subjects who cannot enjoy since he is the one supposed to enjoy. Yet there's something that exceeds a sim simple economy of destruction here, which Dollar and Gros Richard, following with Lacan, call an economy of surplus enjoyment. That is, the subjects who cannot enjoy Nonetheless, enjoy in another way, a surplus enjoyment that accrues only to the sultan or the prophet, as we see in our sectarian representations. The enjoyment of despotic, uh, de uh, despotic subjection is grounded in belief and is a key feature of the fantasy, for we need to believe in their belief, as Gros Richard, Gros Richard recounts in his readings of Western attacks on the character of the prophet Muhammad and his followers, Muslims. Moreover, in this sense, and following the fantasy, Oriental despotism is not a system of brute force after all, but in the terms of the fantasy, it's all about sexuality and obedience. If fantasy, according to Dular and Gorbachev, is all about desire then and the surplus of enjoyment, it also serves as a masking function for something else which cannot find form in the conscious or unconscious mind. The fantasy uh, is a protective veil which mediates enjoyment and keeps us from the edge of this abyss and an annihilating fall into jouissance. Today, we have ripped aside this protective veil and taken the fantasy for reality. Uh, this next section I've titled The Cartoon Nightmare. Uh, I'll tell you more about this fellow. This is uh, General Charles, Charles Gordon, the commander of Khartoum when it was uh, overrun by the Mahdist army in 1885. It is especially with the struggle, uh, especially with the Anglo-Egyptian war in the Sudan of the late 19th century, um, 
that we find all, all of the above. As it coincided, was also instrumental in the emergence of a kind of mass culture-based Orientalism and representations of Islam, which came to play a decisive role in 20th century British and Western society, politics, and everyday life in both formal and informal ways. A massive burst of popular literature accompanied and followed the British war in the Sudan and continued unabated even when the war concluded 14 years later when Kitchener's forces destroyed the Mahdi army and regime at the Battle of Omdurman. By the way, a very, very short battle. Uh, they were using machine guns and they spent 14 years building up to it and annihilated the Mahdi army within hours, uh, if I remember correctly. To that end, I'll trace this movement with reference to two novels in particular, Arthur Conan Doyle, the Sherlock Holmes guy, uh, The Tragedy of the Carrasco, and A.E.W. Mason's often filmed but seldom read Four Feathers. The Mahdi emerged in the, late eight, in the early 1880s and quickly gained a following of the devout and the disaffected, as many were angry with the Anglo-Egyptian taxes and the, and the ban uh, on the slave trade. This is in the Sudan, which was then under the rule of the Egyptian Khedive. Uh, that was the, uh, the government which was uh, appointed and approved by both, jointly by both the British Empire and what was left of the uh, uh, Ottoman Empire. By 1884, the Mahdi army was large and growing, especially after the annihilation of the British Egyptian troops under Hicks Pasha. In early 1884, Gordon was sent to Khartoum to arrange the evacuation by, of Europeans, but once there, he changed his mind, thinking he could beat a siege uh, by the Mahdi army. He was an engineer by training. By February of 1895, Khartoum had fallen and Gordon was dead, famously speared and beheaded uh, on the, the steps of the uh, palace uh, in Khartoum. Gladstone, the PM at the time, did not respond immediately. He had no love for Gordon anyway, but appointed General Kitchener to take measures to defeat the Mahdi. Uh, the latter carefully built a railroad and supply system and nearly 14 years later at the Battle of, Ar uh, of Omr uh, Omdurman, decisively destroyed the Mahdi's army, leadership, and the caliphate. In order to understand the rise of the later popular literature and novels of the 1890s, we have to look back to the pre-war and even wartime coverage in some of the, the newspapers at the time, particularly the Illustrated London News and the Pall Mall Gazette, uh, which actually popped up right in this period. The root of these novels that I'm going to talk about is in this early reportage, and it's what I call the condition of literary possibility. Starting with Hicks Pasha's defeat and extending through 1885, one news weekly, Palmal Gazette, or I'll call it the PMG here, also provided expert information, which included, say, on June 3rd, 1884, background essays on the Mahdi and his origins, on Mahdism, Islam, and the Sudan. Mahdism, as most of you might know, is an Islamic belief in a prophesied redeemer, Muhammad Ahmed, uh, in this instance, a leader of the uh, uh, Samania order. He proclaimed himself the Mahdi in June uh, 1881. His insurrectionist movement was called the Mahdiya. PMG published British expert opinion as well as writers from the region including both Egypt and the Sudan as well as battle diagrams showing the movement and the formation of troops in both camps and in one instance a drawing of a captured Mahdi flag including a translation of the Arabic inscription. Very, very, uh, very, very uh, ironic or well it certainly resonates today given uh, all the images we've seen of the ISIS flag, right? That black flag with the Islamic script on it. I'll show you a picture of the drawing in a second, well, in a few minutes. Yet with the fall of Khartoum and Gordon's gory death, again, he was speared and his head publicly displayed, all of print news venues offered up to the day and even our coverage with screaming headlines stoking the fear and outrage of the British public. After Gordon's death, literary production shifted with a spat of books about the conflict, mostly about Gordon and the Mahdi, as well as various captivity narratives. I mean, again, all of which we have today. The decisive phase of the literary production of the Sudan campaign lies with novels, as I noted above. The two novels in hand are notable because of the celebrity author in the case of tragedy, that is, uh, most people knew Arthur Conan Doyle very well, and for the film history of Four Feathers. Yet there were other immensely popular, in all senses of the word, novels about the Sudan, such as boys' novels like Dash for Khartoum and With Kitchener in the Sudan by the late 19th century author and tycoon of boys' literature, G. A. Henty. Again, they probably don't teach him in the English department here. He's a popular writer um, and forgotten, um, interesting in a historical, ideological sense. Um, and so, 
We move now from boys' novels to adult adventure fiction, The Tragedy of the Carrasco by Arthur Conan Doyle, and then to the novel of Orientalist romance, Four Feathers, and then on to desert romances uh, as an acknowledged genre. Like Henty, Conan Doyle was a successful, popular writer. And also like Henty, he followed his own successful formula with the Sherlock Holmes stories. This, uh, the story turns on opposing scenes, that is, on the tragedy of the Carrasco. That is, the, desk, uh, the deck of the tourist steamer, the Carrasco. It's set up for tea with elegant furniture in China, in contrast to the harsh heat and topography of the desert. It's a group of uh, British, uh, some European, and I think one American tourists, and they're steaming down the Nile. They're doing the Nile tour, or up the Nile, actually, right? Um, and uh, they're on the deck having their tea. And uh, meanwhile, there's a, a war going on around them. I mean, you get the point, right? Yet, the tragedy of the Carrasco is a little more than a cliffhanger in an adventure story set in the Sudan, where Doyle deployed all of the elements introduced in the press coverage of the Sudan campaign in the early 1880s and in popular literature thereafter. Again, to the extent, and for lack of a better way of expressing this point, the tragedy of the Carrasco is structured almost like a porn narrative, for the plot is simply a familiar, well-worn frame upon which scenes are threaded. The characters are not developed in any depth, nor with any complexity or interest as required for the players in popular stories. Indeed, there's no complexity of any sort in this novel, only a stereotype and well-trodden narrative ground. Consider, for example, there's a spinster auntie from Boston. Her name is Miss Adams who, of course, is constantly con concerned with cleanliness and complains about the dirty little Sudanese and their flies and tries even at one point to clean a villager's house. And then there's the Frenchman, who is whiny, duplicitous, uh, Michel, uh, arrogant, uh, and disagrees with the British foreign policy. <laughs> when the group is uh, initially surrounded by the modest, he shouts, vive le uh, califat, vive le mari. <laughs> uh, Farde, that's his name, the antagonist is Colonel Cochrane, who, who plays the, the British retired officer you've probably seen many times in uh, TV and the BBC, uh, recently retired from the British Army, and he's similarly a known type. He is, it seems, the mouthpiece for Conan Doyle. Cochrane, one of the Americans, who's a very practical man, of course, is eventually killed by the modests, uh, but they agree, however, that it is the, quote, unpleasant duty of the English-speaking nations to take care of the sick nations. Uh, and we might think recent, recently of uh, Greece and Spain, but in this instance, it's uh, Egypt and the Sudan. As the American declares, each has his own mission, but then the East never changes, as Co Cochrane makes clear. We should not forget that these are tourists on a package tour, the sort we now take for granted as part of middle-class life. Cooks started such tours to Egypt and the Near East in the 1860s. Moreover, they follow a Baedeker's guide to the region. And they are, for the most part, interested in the ancient sites, not the present people. The, 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 the contemporary Sudanese kind of get in the way, right? Um, while touring one site, Abu Sir, they are attacked by the modests. And as the coverage would have it, the latter appear as they should. They wear the patchwork tunic of the movement, the jibba a sign of Muslim piety and commitment, and they're armed with spears and guns. They're a mix of Arabs and black Africans, known in the text as Negroes, and their leader is a tall, tall and thin, and he sports a long beard and has a piercing gaze. I'll give you a picture uh, of, I don't think there were ever any photographs of uh, the Sudanese Mahdi, um, but there were a lot of ideas of what he should appear, and I have a, a drawing which I'll show you. Um, Years later, and probably working with the same popular sources, Lytton Strachey described uh, Muhammad Ahmed, the illiterate uh, preacher from the Nile island of uh, Dongola, that's the Sudanese Mahdi, as a tall, dark Sudanese man with a long black beard, big eyes, and a piercing gaze, literally the word he used. Of course, like Gordon before them, the tourists are offered a deal where they can convert to Islam or die. They stall the process by debating with an elderly and befuddled imam. The tourists are eventually freed by the combination of bribes to former Egyptian soldiers in the Mahdist group and an attack uh, by the Egyptian Camel Corps, uh, called actually the Gypies. As the Mahdists are surrounded and shot by the British forces, they dismount from their camels, stand on their uh, prayer rugs, and prepare to die, information which Colonel Cochrane relates to the women in the group, and obviously derived from these same early 1880s press reports from the battlefield. By the end of the Sudan campaign, Kitchener had demonstrated the deadly and grotesque capabilities of modern warfare, particularly the machine gun, where Maxim guns replaced the Gatling, 
wiping out the caliphate's fighters in a matter of hours. Thousands of dead littered the battlefield in Omdurman. A contemporary photograph shows the leadership of the caliphate lying dead on the ground, riddled with, riddled with British bullets. Though effective warfare, this was clearly not the sort of victory uh, image to be vaunted, for it really uh, looked like the revenge scene so longed for after all those years, bloody and swift. To the contrary, with the next novel, Four Feathers, uh, written in 1902, uh, we see the way the Sudan campaign was supposed to be remembered. Again, the actual gore of the battlefield wasn't really the way we, uh, Britons wanted to think about it. They wanted to think uh, about the martyrdom of Gordon and the loss, but then it turned in quickly to something else. They weren't really actually interested in the, the, the nastiness of the, the scene of uh, battle at Omdurman. They wanted desert romance, and we're starting to get this with Four Feathers. In fact, Four Feathers is really a love story, a kind of colonialist melodrama. The story concerns Harry Feversham's apparent betrayal of his friends. Um, they went to war and he didn't. When the story starts, he's at a ball with friends. When word arrives that the regiment must be called up for the relief of Gordon. Harry, due to marry Ethne, a very interesting name, given this is all about race, right? Uh, has all, and I think it's also, she's Irish, if I remember correctly. Um, which is also quite interesting, uh, had already resigned his post, but does not tell his comrades. When they find out, they send him three feathers, uh, which he receives in Ethne's presence. She asks him if he did, act out, did, if he did this as an uh, act out of cowardice and, and not for her. Harry is so honorable that he takes on the stigma of dishonor, cowardice, rather than to have Ethne think that he did this for her, for love, that is to stay and marry and be with her. She then hands him a fourth feather from her hat. The story centers around Harry's disappearance from society and then the country as he attempts to return the feathers to his comrades in the Sedan. That is, if you're given one, you have to do something heroic and return it, right? Um, even as his best friend Jack returns from the war blinded and in, as in, in, in turn intent on courting Ethne, the story starts then notably with young Harry listening to his father with uh, his stories about the Crimean War, where British soldiers charged the Russian trenches in a very different kind of warfare. Uh, and it's one of Harry, uh, his father's friends, Such, who extends himself to help Harry through the struggle despite the stigma he bears. So first, this is a novel then about love lost and regained, as Harry eventually returns and Jack cedes his place in Ethne's life. Four Feathers was adopt, uh, adopt, adapted as a film four times. Uh, but it's not really, uh, uh, as a novel, about the nitty gritty of the Sudan campaign. There is, through a, uh, a recount by one of his characters, I think it's actually by um, uh, Jack. Jack was imprisoned in the famous modest prison in Omdurman. Um, and there's a, 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 you know, a few pages about his experience in the prison, how awful it was. Uh, but there actually are very few scenes that, in the novel at least, take place in the Sudan. Now, don't think that uh, filmmakers missed a chance. Of, of course, there are lots of scenes in the Sudan, or what would be the Sudan in the films. Um, and I think that's, ter that, that's very telling. In fact, actually, uh, 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 most of the actual novel takes place in the drawing rooms of uh, British society, and also in Ireland. This leads us, however, to the uh, emergence of, uh, a, I think, a very important genre that's still with us. And I, I think, it actually, I, I know uh, it's at the root of the appeal of, uh, don't, well, you can laugh if you want, Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, and that is the desert romance. In the early 20th century, we see the violence of adventure stories and news reports about the war in the Sudan morph into related romance narratives and then to desert romance as a genre. Now, this genre has roots in the infamous porn novel, The Lustful Turk, which is, I believe was first published in the 18th century and has been in continuous publication since then. It's replete with uh, stories of captive white Christian women, a dark and handsome bay who's also a murderer and a rapist. But, we, we, but here we see these features mapped onto acceptable storylines, that is, in the desert romance. To begin to demonstrate this point, we have to only consider a novel and play that entail more about the prophet and less about, less about the lusty sheikh. That is, uh, Hall Cain's long forgotten The White Prophet. It really is a, was a popular uh, uh, novel that I, I'm sure very few people have read it. Uh, but it's actually, it's, it, I didn't just dig this up as a matter of literary archaeology or something. You know, I, I, it's very, I think, relevant to the argument here. 
Apart from his brief foray into melodrama set in the Near East, and in this case, Egypt, Hall Caine was otherwise a very su successful novelist, best known for his novel, The Manxman, and, and other bestsellers, and for his performance as a late Victorian and, and Edwardian literary personality. The novel itself, the White, uh, uh, the White Prophet, is a melodrama about the rise of a new imam, more Mahdi's, right, amongst the poor of Egypt, a man who, while educated at Al-Azhar University, the Islamic uh, Center of Islamic Learning in Cairo, is very much a man of the people, an Egyptian nationalist. And his name is Ishmael Amir. And the populace proclaims him a new Mahdi, which in 1909 was certainly a tough topic for the British public. Indeed, the analogy with first the Mahdi Ahmed of the Sudan, the historic figure, and then with Jesus Christ, no less, is obvious and rather strained. Ishmael's father, uh, of course, was a Libyan carpenter and a boat builder who moved to, the, uh, to Khartoum. Ishmael's earliest memories are of a white pasha pacing, that will be Gordon, pacing the roof of the consular palace looking for relief boats which never arrived. Again, for a British readership of the early 20th century, this is an obvious, if not contrived, reference to the siege of Khartoum and the eventual death of General Gordon and the massacre of the Khartoum populace. Only slightly less obvious, while imprisoned for sedition, Ishmael is forced to marry a Coptic Christian woman, an insult which he in instead embraced, loving this woman as his wife in inspiration and suggesting then the relationship between uh, Jesus and Mary Magdalene. The parallel narrative follows the rise of one Charles Gordon Lord, the son of the Governor General, Lord Nunum, and a rising star in the British Army in Egypt. When the novel opens, we learn that he has had a long-standing uh, love affair with Helen Graves, the daughter of his commanding officer, General Graves. Uh, this Gordon, rather like the Orientalist heroes of the 19th century, grew up in Egypt, nursed by an Egyptian woman, Fatima, the mother of his closest friend and fellow soldier. soldier. Gordon also speaks Arabic and does not hide his love for the Arab world in contrast to his lover and her father. At one point, echoing her father's sentiments, Helen proclaims that the British army must smash the Mahdi, which is a line directly lifted from W.T. Stead's interview with Gordon in the Pall Mall Gazette. Uh, he said as he stepped onto a boat, it was literally a, a last minute interview, I'm going to Khartoum and I will smash the Mahdi. It's not surprising that then that Gordon defies his superior and argues with him about his plan to attack this new uh, Mahdi's uh, camp, angering the older man so that he assaulted Gordon in the process, fell to the ground, and suffered a fatal heart attack. The death, however, is blamed on Ishmael, who had visited the general earlier in the day, and Helen, believing this man killed her father, goes to his camp disguised as, disguised as an Indian Muslim princess. She speaks Arabic and is familiar uh, 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 with Isla Islamic tradition. Ishmael falls in love with her and marries her as his Rani, though vowing it would never be a carnal marriage. As she plots to kill Ishmael, Gordon is also in disguise in the camp. You get the point, right? Um, de determined to help Amir succeed given his support for his liberal and populist brand of Islamic nationalism. The story comes to a head when the Mahdi Ishmael and his people march on Cairo in a nonviolent tax protest and a general dis demonstration against British rule, again suggesting Jesus and Roman rule. He's greeted in the streets, riding astride a donkey, and a military attack and disaster is only narrowly averted. In the end, Ishmael divorces Helen to help Gordon, and the latter is reinstated in the army and promoted. Um, this particular desert romance has obvious roots uh, in the Gordon story. We're starting to see a little of a, bit of a change, however, with Edith Hull's The Shake, which is I would say the most representative and best known example of Orientalism in British American and mass culture and the best example of this shift. Unlike her male predecessors of the 19th century, Hull, which was a pseudonym for Edith Maud Winstanley, was not of the aristocracy nor from a wealthy family. Rather, she was actually a fairly ordinary a housewife uh, of an English farmer who actually went off to war, the First World War. She wrote the novel during the war. Indeed, Hull did not even visit North Africa. The, the Sheikh has set in Biskra, uh, 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 an infamous tourist destination in Algeria, uh, the former colonized Algeria, nor the Middle East, until she and her family were able to do so with the earnings from the hugely popular novel. And the novel was popular from the moment she published it in Britain in 1919 and the United States in 1921. As critic Susan Blake notes, quote, it was the first novel to appear on the bestseller list two years in a row. By 1965, it had sold 
uh, nearly 1.2 million hardback copies. In the United States, it ran through 50 printings in 1921 alone. The story remains familiar today, even for those who've never read the novel or seen the film, which fixed the place of Rudolph Valentino in Hollywood legend. The plot is about abduction and captivity, rape and humiliation, race, though the word at the time would have been uh, miscegenation, uh, and religion, Islam, love, and class. It is a mix of plot elements that might be found in part in other texts, but it's distinctly Orientalist as a whole group of collected features. Again, I have a clip to share with you and discuss in a minute. Now, the counterpart to this uh, mass-produced British Orientalist tradition is that there's a very popular writer at the same time who gives up his career uh, as, a, as a novelist uh, and turns to Islam. His name is Marmaduke Pickdall. And for me, he's uh, really probably one of the most interesting figures among British writers of the late 19th and early 20th century, a period punctuated by the Great War and in literature by the rise of what we know as the modernist movement. Marmaduke Pickdall published reviews and serialized versions of his works during the fin de siècle period in very, very prominent journals such as the Cornhill Magazine, 19th century, which became 20th century, obviously, uh, Academy, and Athenaeum. You maybe heard of a couple of these. All of these journals were either mainstays or held a prominent place as respected journals directed towards an educated middle and upper middle class readership. Pictall was one of 12 children born to Mary and Reverend Charles Pictall, though the family had social st some so social standing given his father's position in the church. His father died in 1881, and the family experienced great financial hardship. Still, Marmaduke attended Harrow as a day student. You know Harrow is a great one of the public schools of Britain, uh, while his fellow students included Winston Churchill and L.S. Amory. Following his fail failure to gain a position in the Levant Consular Service as a young adult, and at the invitation of a family acquaintance, Pictall visited Syria for an extended stay from 1894 to 1896. Syria then included modern Lebanon at the time, as well as uh, Mandate Palestine. And a young Marmaduke traveled the countryside and also spent time in the major cities of the region, Beirut, uh, Quds, uh, Jerusalem, and Shem, Damascus. He spent a good deal of time traveling off the usual tourist routes while making friends and, and contacts among the local population wherever he went. Indeed, Pictal learned Arabic and much about the culture of the region to the outrage of his fellow countrymen, and even went so far as to shun the company of fellow Britons, Europeans, and Christians. This was the formative experience of his life, launching him as a writer and eventually as a major figure in the Islamic world of the 20th century. Pictal was a modestly successful writer in the early 20th century, specifically from 1903 to 1922. Most of his novels and short stories from this period concerned the Middle East, and all were published by established houses such as Methuen, Collins, and John Mur Murray, as well as Knopf in the United States. Pictal was clearly both an accomplished and prolific professional writer. However, perhaps Pictal is a significant intellectual figure today simply because he converted to Islam in the middle of his adult life uh, again, thinking, resonating with uh, the news of this morning. Um, it quickly gained an important status with first the British, uh, the Muslim community in Britain, and then in the, is, uh, the Islamic world as a whole. But t today he's unknown, having fallen far out of the canon of early 20th century British literature. Yet to identify him as a British Muslim, as Peter Clark does in the title of his biography, Marmaduke Pictall, British Muslim, is not to diminish his work as a writer, but to emphasize that he converted in a time when such a move was still viewed as a scandal. I'd say it's probably still viewed as a scandal. Pictall actually announced his conversion in 1917. There were, there were early indications of a slow rejection of Christianity in some of his prior work. In 1914, for example, he walked out of a church gathering when the, when the congregation sang For the Mohammedans, uh, the hymn of Charles Wesley. Uh, with its racist lines about the Arab thief. As Clark notes in the summer of 1917, Pictal, quote, gave a series of talks to the Muslim Literary Society in Notting Hill, West London, on Islam and progress. It was during the last of these talks that Pictal told the audience of his conversion to Islam, explaining that it was only Islam which could be considered as a progressive religion, hence the title of his lecture. Indeed, he underlined his commitment to Islam by taking Muhammad for his first name in lieu of the very English Marmaduke. From this point on, Islam was the center of his spiritual and intellectual life. Again, Clark's, Clark's excellent biography provides a detailed account of the writer's conversion and related activism. 
In these two chapters, Clark makes interesting comments on the way Pictal argued for Islam to both Muslims and the West in the shadow of the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the Caliphate, yet in ways which were unique. With regard to political notions of tolerance and the rights of women and a more general supportive relationship to the sciences and modernity, Pictal always cast Islam as more Western than the West or more English than the English in this respect. The circumstances surrounding the book for which Pictal is best known today and which even now is available, available for purchase worldwide, unlike most of his fiction, are relevant here. I'm referring to Pictal's well-known translation and commentary, The Meaning of the Glorious Quran. He started the project in 1928 with a series of consultations and meetings with notable figures in Islamic and Arabic literary studies at the Islamic uh, Al-Azhar University, that, the same one where the fictional uh, uh, Mahdi uh, 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 Ishmael uh, studied. From the start, the project was controversial sin since it is a translation of a sacred text, uh, Haram. Though the sharpest critic of the book, Taha Hussein, was not a religious figure, but rather a professor of Arabic literature at the University of Cairo. Still, what we should take from this controversy and the aftermath is that Pictal survived the critical storm, and even today, the meaning of the glo glorious Quran remains a significant text. Look it up. Get a copy this afternoon. It's more than a mere translation and around the world. It was first published in 1930 by the now major publishing house Alfred Knopf of New York City. In his writing about Islam, Pictal looks to, what most, uh, to that which most Britons would define as the not British to propose that Islam is in fact more British or Western than Britain or the West. He goes on to drive this point home by noting that art in the West is alienated from human life and human values, and in this context, an expression of decay in values. Art is valued over human life, and this, and perhaps this explains some, some recent uh, destruction of uh, historic sites to some extent, this kind of thinking. Um, and this is a valuation which no Muslim or Islamic society would ever propose. Indeed, he pushes further. And as though to answer the tradition of Matthew Arnold, he argues that Islam's emphasis on human life entails political and intellectual tendencies, which, while the West espouses them, are in fact contrary to history and fact. In particular, he argues that with Islam, there is no opposition to scientific inquiry, as there is in Christianity, while the democracy of the West is a sham of the priesthood, unlike the priest-free brotherhood of the Muslim world. Again, we have here a band of brothers. Um, I thought I'd... Uh, before I get to the second part, I thought that we should maybe take a look at some pictures here. This is, uh, you can use the pointer. Uh, I think it's, yeah, here it is. Uh, this is uh, General Gordon. Uh, I actually have this. This is not taken from my version, of my, my copy of the photograph. But it was uh, mass produced as a, uh, a carte de visite, about that big. Um, so, which probably explains why the quality of this particular uh, uh, reproduction is so bad. I mean, it had been produced so many times. You want to talk about mass production. Here we have a, the mass production of a martyr. Uh, notice his uniform. Uh, his nickname was Chinese Gordon. I don't know if any of you know that his story. But he, he uh, really made his name uh, supporting the, uh, um, the uh, royal uh, family of, uh, uh, I forgot which, uh, uh, which particular kingdom it was. But they, uh, uh, in putting down the Taiping uh, Rebellion in China in the 19th century, uh, which was a religious nationalist uh, uprising. Um, and uh, he and I think some French and American officers actually headed the, uh, the rump army of the, uh, of the kingdom and defeated the, Ta well, basically besieged and defeated the uh, Taiping rebels. Uh, but so you see some of the details of his uniform here. He also was, after that, appointed. Uh, the Khadiv in the Sudan in the 1870s. He had a couple of tours in the Sudan. So you see elements which are at once um, Orientalist in the Far Eastern sense, and then Orientalist in the uh, Middle Eastern or North African or East African sense, uh, incorporated into his uniform. Um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of your fellow audience members commented that, uh, is he this a little bit like uh, uh, Ataturk? And I said, no. I mean, the Kemalist uh, uh, image would have been of the 1920s would have been very European, uh, you know, a gentleman who, if you go to Turkey, you'll see, well, at least you used to be able to get see these statues. Every, I think we have one at home. Uh, uh, Ataturk with his cane. I mean, he was a Parisian gentleman. Um, clearly, Gordon, coming from the empire, was out of his way to uh, you know add something a little bit different. 
so hence his look. Most of these adventurers, uh, military figures, uh, orientalists of the period, usually adopted some kind of a sort of sign of the other into their persona. Uh, in fact, there's a good picture, if you want to look it up privately, of him uh, in, uh, in fact, a, a Chinese military costume, um, which was also, I believe, also circulated as a carte de visite. Let's see if I can get to my next uh, set of pictures here. Uh, this is taken from the coverage of the Sudan War uh, was uh, not only just news, but they uh, sent out uh, telegraph uh, operators uh, as well as artists and, of course, photographers. And uh, so you, you basically see it's a multi multimedia coverage. Uh, and uh, a couple of artists went and, uh, you know, from... I guess life experience came up with various paintings which were then uh, reproduced, this being one of them, uh, being uh, a representation of a modest uh, uh, cavalry charge. Uh, early on, before the, uh, the fall of, uh, of uh, Khartoum, uh, sort of the first wave of, of British hysteria over the, the well, the the bad news from the Sudan campaign was that the famous British Square had been repeatedly broken by the Mahdists. They were, because they were very agile with uh, camels and horses, and uh, uh, basically uh, using uh, unorthodox guerrilla uh, 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 hit and run uh, tactics, which you know, the British, with their very sort of fixed military ideology, weren't able to cope with. Uh, the British Square was repeatedly broken. Uh, in the longer version, which you should fear, the longer version of this paper, uh, I had the whole. Uh, um, I should actually read it to you if I have, I have it here. The whole long uh, poem by, yeah, it's uh, Vitae uh, uh, Lampada. Do any of you know this poem? It's by Sir, uh, Sir Henry John Newbolt. It's a very well-known poem, at least it was back in the day. The sand in the desert is sodden red, red with the wreck of the square that would be the British military square that broke. The Gatlings jammed and the Colonel dead and the regiments blind with dust and smoke. I need to put the right accent here. The river of death has brimmed its banks and England's far and honor a name. But the voices of a schoolboy rally, rallies the ranks. Play up, play up, and play the game. Uh, you see these lines actually in, in today in British uh, sports reportage. You know, play the game, play up, play up. Um, the, the origins of it actually have to do with the uh, poet's uh, days. I think he was headmaster at Clifton College in Bristol, which is a, one of the well-known public schools. Um, and the, uh, the square where they played cricket uh, was, of course, resonating with the broken square of the Sudan. Okay, here's a cover of G.A. Henty's uh, Dash for Khartoum. This is, oh, hold on, I wish I could stop this for a second. This is the uh, drawing of the Mahdi that I referred to. Uh, there was no life model. <laughs> I mean, this is just what, this came out of the imaginary. Um, the piercing eyes, right. Uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, poster for one of the versions of the Four Feathers. The folks know the more recent version with uh, uh, is it, uh, uh, Heath Ledger? The, back there was uh, uh, a version of the fall of... Hmm. Yeah, this was... Uh, I forgot the date on this film, but it's uh, at least from the uh, uh, late 50s or early 60s. But uh, notice the cast. Uh, well, you all know who's brandishing the gun, of course, right? The man of the gun lobby. Uh, with Laurence Olivier playing the, the Mahdi. This is Pictal. Again, um, he was very uh, enamored of the Turks uh, and wrote some uh, whatever the... Uh, idealism of his uh, writing about Western Islam, his uh, writing about, uh, uh, about Turkey and the uh, Armenian genocide was absolutely inexcusable. Uh, he became a kind of apolo an apologist, um, you know, if not declared so, I think a de facto apologist for the Kemal regime. 
Uh, but you could see the Kemalist look here. You know, he looks, you know, he's not, you know, in any uh, ethnic attire here. He's not declaring his religion. His religion is in his head and in his heart, right? Um, he otherwise looks like a middle class, so he could be a doctor. And that brings us to the second part of the talk, which concerns uh, a group of writers, some of whom you may know. Uh, this one here you know. Uh, I know it's not a great photograph. Uh, Salman Rushdie, Martin Amos, uh, and this is his wife, Isabel Fonseca. And uh, back here is uh, Christopher Hitchens. Just so you know what I'm talking about when I get there. Uh, this is one of the covers, many covers, of Martin Amos's uh, a more recent novel, Lionel Asbo. Do any of you know what an Asbo is? Order, yeah. It's an antisocial behavior order. It's a kind of a, uh, it's a sort of epithet. You know, uh, somebody, you, you want to say the neighbor's kid is a real loser. He's an Asbo, you know. Uh, it's a slur, you know. Um, I, I'd actually say that the, uh, the cover of the novel is very much a class slur. Uh, a class slur of the British working class. Um, if you could sort of see some of the imagery, imagery here. And I don't think actually whoever ever put this together is uh, really far from capturing the spirit of Amos's outlook on, uh, well, contemporary Britain. Um, you know, if he is on the one hand a, a kind of a racist and certainly anti-Islam, um, uh, on the other hand there's a sort of a class aspect of his, uh, of his work which I think we uh, should pay attention to. Okay. Okay, let's leave it with that image there. Okay, in 2007, Terry Eagleton, the well-known literary critic, scholar, and rabble rouser, published, he's a kind of a rabble rouser, published a short piece in The Guardian where he decried the British writer today. His reasons for making such a statement are worth repeating here as his comments are both on target and, well, funny in a vicious way. Quote, the knighting of Salman Rushdie is the establishment's reward for a man who moved from being a remorseless satirist of the West to cheering on his criminal adventures in Iraq and Afghanistan. David Hare caved into the blandishments of Buckingham Palace some years ago, moving from radical to reformist. Christopher Hitchens, who looked set to become the George Well de nos jours, is likely to be remembered as our Evelyn Waugh having thrown in his lot with Washington's neocons. Martin Amos has written of the need to prevent Muslims traveling and to strip search people who, quote, look like they're from the Middle East or from Pakistan. Deportation, he considers, may be essential further down the road. For Eagleton, these writers are a far cry from their antecedents who, while mostly writers of the left, were all critics of the savagery of modern Britain. Men, women, modernists, socialists, right-wingers, professors, and scoundrels, none of these earlier generation of writers uh, were ever properly established. However, it's with the la later wave of po post-war writers, notably Philip Larkin and Martin Amos' father, Kingsley Amos, who, by the way, uh, wrote one of, the, one of the best academic novels you might know, Lucky Jim, um, uh, that a change was marked. Uh, that is through the uh, angry young men period of the 1950s as these in turn became what Eagleton has dubbed the dyspeptic old buffers. Irish Mur Murdoch and Doris Lessing, despite promise, also turned to the right. Yet as before with I uh, Ireland and with the uh, uh, other famous example of Conrad, it was outsiders, non-Britons, who offered hope and renewal. A group which included V.S. Naipaul, Salman Rushdie, W.G. Sebald, and Tom Stoppard. Now, though Eagleton does not tell us much about Naipaul in the quote I just shared, the author's position on immigration, global capitalism, race, and Islam is fairly clear in, say, a novel such as Bend in the River and in his travelogue Among the Believers. That was, I think, early 1980s. That was about Muslims and what he saw as a rising fundamentalism. As with the novel, Naipaul's observations are sharp and accurate in the travelogue, but it's how he frames these observations and insights and what he finally does with them, all in the context of, well, Enoch Powell, still in a political sense alive, of the, and the continued collapse of the empire and post-colonial immigration and the slow ero erosion of a coherent left opposition that would be mark the rise of Thatcher and Thatcherism in Britain. 1981 saw the publication of two books then about Muslim parts of the world. These were um, 
I, I amend that date here. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, we'll stay with that. Uh, 1981 saw two publication of book, uh, 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 two books that were about uh, the Muslim world among the believers, as I just noted, as well as Salman Rushdie's uh, very good novel, Midnight's Children. The latter novel was Salman Rushdie's first acclaimed novel, and for which he was awarded the 1981 Booker Prize, and is widely considered one of his best, if not his best, novel. Midnight's Children combines allegory and autobiography with what we know as magic realism, that is the fantastic and supernatural presented in realist narrative and prose, as it traces the lives and doings of children born at midnight somewhere between August 14th and 15th of 1947 when India became independent and partitioned with the simultaneous birth of both, uh, birth of the majority Muslim Pakistan. These children have powers, telepathy, and their lives are intertwined with the fates and tragedies of the two new nations. Again, there's a good deal of autobiography here, or at least overlap, as Salman Rushdie was born into an Indian Muslim family in Bombay, Mumbai, on June uh, of 1947. By the way, his name uh, was, uh, his family changed their name uh, to uh, Rushdie, taking the name from uh, Avaro's family name, Ibn Rush Rushd. It also sounds sort of Anglo. The family stayed in Bombay for a while before moving to Pakistan, though the young Salman was packed off to the rugby school. Again, we're back to these British public schools, um, and who went to the rugby school and uh, whose father was uh, headmaster of the rugby school, Matthew Arnold. Uh, young Salman went there, however, as a teenager, and he finished before then going on to complete his undergraduate education at Cambridge University. I think Rushdie's education and life experience thereof provides important insight as first his connection to India-Pakistan was severed and he spent his formative years amongst young, privileged, and mostly white British children. Moreover, the boarding school experience, while it entails a specific culture, also has a specific literary history. And it's something he's written about. Indeed, the Indian character in Charles Hamilton's Billy Bunter, uh, Greyfriars novels, maybe some of you have read these, uh, that's boys' literature, again, of the early 20th century. Uh, there was a character named, uh, and again, you can hear the epithet, Hurry Jamset Ram Singh, an outsider insider at the school who, uh, an outsider being that he was uh, literally uh, 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 blacked by the standards of the boys, their racist standards, uh, yet he was accepted, the insider, because, well, he was a good bowler. We're, again, back to the cricket match on the, on the square. Now, Rushdie has acknowledged this character, but let's consider him again with regard then to the satanic verses. Midnight's Children was followed by 1985 Shame, which was a Booker Prize runner-up, and was also based on the subcontinent. And then, in 1988, he published the uh, controversial satanic verses, which is largely based in post-colonial London, uh, Elwyn Dion. Novels which followed include The Moor's Last Sigh, Fury, Shalimar the Clown, and the recent uh, uh, and satanic verses related to Joseph Anton, which is more autobiographical. Yet it is the satanic verses for which Rushdie is known. Again, the novel was published in September of 1988 and was banned the following October in India for its anti-Islamic content, though in November Rushdie was awarded the Whitbread Book Prize in the West for the novel, which was then burned in Bradford the following January of 1989 with demonstrations against the book in Hyde Park. Of course, on February 14, 1989, Valentine's Day, the Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran issued a fatwa against Rushdie and Viking Penguin, um, uh, a, a, a death threat. Um, on February 18, Rushdie apologized to no avail, publicly apologized to no avail, and riots followed in the same month in Bombay with demonstrations in New York and Berkeley. In, in March 1989, the Nobel Prize Committee was split over consideration of the novel, and Britain broke off diplomatic relations with Iran. Though the Islamic Conference Organization refused to support the Ayatollah's fatwa, demonstrations continued around the world with 50,000 gathering to protest in London. By June 4th, the Ayatollah had died, yet the fatwa remained in place as it does today. On August 17th, 1989, Salman Rushdie went into hiding. Now, perhaps many of you know uh, why this novel is still controversial, though a brief uh, summary of the satanic verses might help understand the enduring debate and its place here in a talk about Islam and British literature. The novel is comprised of several storylines, with the primary and uh, unifying storyline being, story being the life stories, or rather posthumous stories, of one Jibril Farishta, a Bollywood star when he was alive, known for his portrayals of most deities from most religions. 
Um, he and Saladin Shamsha, an Indian-born but London-based voice actor, somehow survived the terrorist bombing of their London-bound Air India flight by a bungling group of Sikh terrorists. The novel includes a good deal of backstory about each man as well as their adventures in the present time of the novel. Both, uh, for both somehow survived though transformed. The new Shamsha, uh, the toady, has horns, hooves, a tail, a large penis. He's a very devilish character. Well, Farishta is, as always, an angel, the angel Gabriel. As with most of Rushdie's novels, the storyline is determined by the love lives of his characters, that is, his uh, ex-wives, deceased lovers who appear in the sky, old age pensioner lovers, and so on. There's another narrative uh, in the novel, however, uh, about an Islamic female butterfly-eating mystic named Aisha, who leads an ill-fated pilgrimage to Mecca and into the sea, but it's the sections titled Mahund and the Return to Jahiliya where we encounter the source of the controversy. Well, first there is then the Imam who eats his people, clearly the Ayatollah himself, uh, which according to legend infuriated him. And then there are the dreams of Jibril Farishta uh, that are about a cynical and corrupt man in this uh, town of Jahiliya who claims to be a prophet. His name is Mahund and he has a ragtag following. Mahund, which we know very well is a, a Renaissance English epithet against the prophet, uh, while Jahiliya, we know, uh, uh, is, means ignorance. And the terms of his success concern the sacred text of his movement as well. This Mahund initially denounced the gods of, and goddesses of the city, um, but then agreed to accept three of them as a, as a political deal and the justification uh, was written into the text as a dream account. Later, he reneged on this deal uh, with the polytheistic powers of the city and accordingly changed the text with a new dream. So if you get it, it's, you know, the, uh, for uh, a devout Muslim, the, the blasphemy is, uh, is piling up, right? Um, and then it goes on. Uh, later, he reneged on the deal. Meanwhile, there was a local brothel called The Curtain where the prostitutes uh, uh, masqueraded as the uh, wives of this, of Mahun the prophet. In his defense, Rushdie and, his, and, and, and others point out that this is just a dream sequence in the novel. Um, one critic, uh, Sanjay uh, Subramaniam, uh, really comments, I think, uh, interestingly that uh, why would anybody have read this novel in the first place? Uh, it's 600 pages and it's not an easy read. It involves a lot of in jokes. Uh, it's, there are at least three languages in it. Um, but then he also uh, does wonder uh, about the organization of the novel. I'll just uh, to try to cut to the chase here. The novel uh, really functions just as, as, as Rushi defends it. It's a novel about post-colonial London, a, a novel about exile and immigration. but. Um, why is this, this, the, why is this section in there in the first place? It doesn't, doesn't work. The novel might have been, say, 400 pages and worked very effectively, just as he declared it, uh, as a kind of a follow-up to uh, Midnight's Children and Shame in particular. So I think that's a very sort of apt criticism that we should uh, uh, bear in mind. The second thing is that for the, uh, the South Asian population of Britain, uh, it's, not, it, it's not just, and this will, I think, touches on the Charlie Hebdo sensitivities and debate, but the novel was not just uh, 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 an anti-Islamic smear and blasphemous, but it was a communal smear in a, in a sort of strange way. The lead characters have absolutely nothing to do with the majority South Asian diaspora population, right? They are not working class. Um, their lives are very different from uh, the actual lives of, say, uh, uh, working class uh, Britons of South Asian descent in Bradford. Um, Moreover, the, the characters speak a kind of a schoolboy slang, uh, which uh, is a, a, a kind of a South Asian schoolboy slang, which uh, is at once insulting, right? At the same time, just sort of you know, far from the reality. Uh, let me quickly get to, to save some time here, get to Martin Amos. Uh, Martin Amos, uh, as you know, is the son of Kingsley Amos and a very well-known writer, London Fields, maybe some of you know. Um, he uh, recently actually moved to Cobble Hill, Brooklyn, which is the uh, uh, epicenter, one of the traditional uh, Arab uh, American communities in North, well, Arab American communities in New York City, uh, just uh, a few blocks from Atlantic Avenue. I find that a very interesting uh, irony. Um, 
Recently, in an interview, well, actually, in the past few, uh, past couple of years, in an interview uh, in the Daily Mail, he's made some statements uh, which he's repeated one way or the other. And they're, I think, I'll, I'll repeat them very quickly. He he said, "I feel very morally superior to Islamists by some distance." He says Islamists, but if you actually follow what he says about Islam, it's fairly clear he means Islam and Muslims. I feel an intellectual distance to Islam. There are great problems with Islam. The Quran recommends the beating of women. He went on. Some societies are just more evolved than others, he said. I'm not saying these people are genetically incapable of not being terrorists. I'm just saying some societies are more evolved than others. Young men in these kinds of societies are growing up full of loathing and hatred. Something has to be done about it, and he has a plan. There's a definite urge, don't you have it, to say the Muslim community will have to suffer until it gets its house in order. Not letting them travel, deportation further down the road, curtailing of freedoms, strip searching people who look like they're from the Middle East or from Pakistan, discriminatory stuff until it hurts the whole community and they start getting tough with their children. He's advocating uh, collective punishment. Now, in fairness, these comments follow the 7 7 attacks in London, and if nothing else, Amos seems to take these terrorist events personally, as we know in the title essay of his 2008 collection, The Second Plane, where he begins with a family member's eyewitness account of the attacks. Uh, he talks about the planes flying low over Washington Square, which, if any of you have been to New York, uh, that's simply not possible. Uh, it's surrounded by the towers of NYU. I mean, uh, I did it. It just is a, very, it's a very strange claim. This book of essays is then largely about Islam, or as he equivocates, Islam, Islamists. The, Amos does criticize Bush and Blair and contend their wars. Um, the, the, the essay to look for, uh, I think, in the collection, The Second Plane, is The Last Days of Muhammad Atta. But you know, he's trying to get inside the mindset of Muhammad Atta, one of the uh, organizing figures of the Second Plane attack. Um, but he seems to have little understanding, actually, of, uh, of, of who Atta was, meaning where he came from, his communal commitments, uh, uh, what was going on in Egypt at the time. I mean, presumably, uh, maybe his father was in the Brotherhood and you know, on some kind of a list, uh, imprisoned, etc. Uh, he, uh, I think, really shows a sort of little, um, you know, in some sense, his little sort of um, understanding. I mean, not that I'm not trying to defend any of this. So don't get that idea at all. Um, but uh, another essay also has to do with Syed Kut uh, Kutub, uh, one of the uh, uh, considered the fathers of Islamism, uh, um, and his 1950s adventures in Greeley, Colorado, which you probably heard about. But that's kind of shooting fish in a barrel as far as I'm concerned. It's, um, I could tell you more privately about that. But back to Lionel Asbo, uh, we might begin to see some useful connections. This is a, a 2012 novel, and it has a familiar set of Amos characters, no, n notably the repulsive Lionel Asbo of the title. Uh, Lionel Asbo uh, is an, uh, an uncle, and he takes care of his uh, uh, orphaned uh, nephew. The orphaned nephew does well in school and eventually leaves the little horrible town. Lionel Asbo, meanwhile, uh, being as kind of a career criminal and a lumpen proletariat, of course, winds up in prison again. But while in prison, uh, for his misadventures, he wins the lottery, uh, and of course, the 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 novel is largely about his, uh, uh, shall we say, wasteful ways of spending the money. Um, now, there's several novels which which are actually far more sy sympathetic to uh, British Islam, notably Monica Ali's Brick Lane, but I actually think uh, Hanif Qureshi's The Black Album of 1985 is the uh, the best. I mean, for me, and it's interesting. Uh, I could probably find Wikipedia entries from m almost everything I've mentioned so far, even the Dash for Khartoum, but there's no Wikipedia entry for the Black Album, and I think that's interesting. Um, why? Well, you probably know uh, uh, Hanif Qureshi's work. Uh, if not uh, directly, indirectly, you uh, will know maybe Daniel Day-Lewis's uh, film, My Beautiful Laundrette. No? Uh, Sammy and Rosie Get Laid, uh, amongst others. London Kills Me. Uh, uh, this, uh, this is uh, Hanif Qureshi. He also wrote a short play, or short, short play, which uh, was a preamble, uh, as we C to the Black Album, which is titled My Son the Fanatic, and I'll show you a clip from that. Um, this novel, The Black Album, is about a group of uh, young South Asian men at an unnamed university. It's not the University of London. It's clearly one of the second tier schools. Uh, uh, and its central character is Shahid, who is from the suburbs. The others are from the inner city. And uh, it's about the group cohering in that they're all South Asian as a community and cohering around that experience and then being in school. But um, 
how the rest of the group becomes more Islamized as one of their number, Riyaz, uh, begins to push a kind of uh, a Said Qutb uh, line. Um, uh, meanwhile, Shahid is both going along with the group because, well, they're his friends in his community, but at the same time, he's having an affair with his English teacher, uh, D, the one D.D. D. Osgood. These are very British characters, who, of course, is very, very PC. Uh, the group becomes more and more uh, political. Uh, they go to the local council estate to defend a Pakistani family, Pakistani British family, from being uh, racist attacks. Uh, the ante's up as Riyadh deci Riyaz decides that they have to attack the book meaning the satanic verses. They eventually burn the book. Uh, uh, there's a big back and forth between Didi, the uh, defender of all PC values in modern Britain, and uh, freedom of the speech and the press, uh, and of course Riaz, who retorts, you're not letting me speak. You know, what is this hypocrisy of British democracy? You will not let the South Asian man speak. Um, uh, and also to say that this act, this burning, the burning satanic verses, is in fact a, an act of free speech. Um, you see here mobilized, again, some of the critiques of the West and the hypocrisy of, uh, of what they believe to be a colonialist West uh, uh, ideology, namely democracy. Uh, let me sort of end with that. Um, I, I would like to show you the uh, clip, at least with Hanif Qureshi, before we take some questions. I was going to show you the shake. Uh, uh, this clip from the shake uh, is uh, interesting, going back to the first part of the talk, uh, in that the uh, woman lead, uh, a young American woman, uh, out for a, a, sort of a, an adventure on her own with a, uh, a man who doesn't protect her as he should, I think we're to assume by the novel and the film. Uh, she goes to Biskra, which was a kind of a casino town, and uh, winds up uh, uh, going out on a desert trip and, of course, is uh, attacked uh, and taken captive by Rudolf Valentino. Uh, this clip I was going to show you, uh, look, this is a novel. I, I, I have to be straightforward with you. It's, uh, it's about rape. You know, um, uh, he's the tall, dark, handsome man, but he's, uh, uh, he's violent, sexually violent. Um, I think it's interesting back to this idea of the, of the, the shieldings, of the prophylactic function, as it were, of the fantasy. Uh, what's going on in this period in the early 20th century is the women's movement, right? Um, in some ways, the film is a kind of a working through of uh, women's sexuality and women's power. And it's, it's resolving in its sort of strange ways or cutting off uh, in other ways uh, uh, the possibility of a sort of uh, the well, a threat of castration, I guess. Um, but you can look at that for yourself. It's amazing, though, that the novel and the film actually had a very large female audience. Actually, men didn't like it. They, co they considered uh, uh, Valentino uh, uh, effeminate. And here's a clip from a quick interview with... Uh, it's very traumatic if you're an immigrant, obviously. Uh, I would know that. But one of, one of the things that I noticed amongst the, the, the young kids who became fundamentalists that I wrote about in this, this film and also in the Black Album was that they, their parents had come to the West, but the kids wanted to remain Muslims because they wanted to identify with their community and with their family. But their rebellion consisted in their being more Muslim than their parents. So I would go to meetings in the, in the mosque and they'd say, oh, my parents, they're really bad. My dad had whiskey last night. You know, my mother didn't say her prayers. And they'd go, oh, what do you do? What do you say? I denounced them. You know, I said to them, why aren't you more being more Muslim and so on and so on. And it was extraordinary, um, extraordinary procedure, which, which, how could you not want to write about that? I, again, we have to... It's, it's have always to seemed ask. to me to be an enormous shame that there are certain what versions of Islam that, us, that do disavow readers, another tradition market. of Islam, which and is, what is you not. see... The Black Album has the Wikipedia like entry. Like I rest my case. Garden, you know. And particularly in The Thousand and One Nights. If you actually read The Thousand and One Nights, it's a filthy read. and there's, It's full of sexual pleasure and, 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 you know, all kinds of low and vulgar comedy and humor. Um, and it's a real shame that the, the, the Muslim community as it now is trying to see itself, is disavowing all that. And it'll be very interesting to see when, when as it were, the, when the repressed starts to, 
starts to, start, starts to come back, starts to return. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, very intriguing. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. We have a microphone over there. So if you would be kindly uh, walk to the microphone and ask a question, we would appreciate that. If you want to go to lunch, that's okay with me. <laughs> Hi, um, I just had a question about after the 1930s and whether the Orientalist tradition continued as it had existed before then or whether it was kind of beginning the shift towards what you get um, with Rushdie and Amos and later. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I was just wondering what the, if the tradition kind of kept with that schoolboy type narratives or if it significantly changed, say with the angry young men. Yeah. Um, I think the potential for the change is with the angry young men, but if you think about, you're all familiar with the, uh, the cult around the film and the, the figure of Lawrence of Arabia, I'd say that that, that cult uh, does hold sway, yeah, through the 60s and 70s for sure. Um, uh, the, the potential for change is there. Uh, I think it comes to the fore and we get a break. And again, I, this is just a conjecture. You know, this is just some recent thinking of mine, and I'm, I'm happy to be proved wrong. Um, but uh, I think that the break we get in the 1980s was a common, uh, but it happened in the 1980s for reasons. Um, I would say probably, again, the, the collapse of the British Labour Party, in Britain at least, um, the, the rise of uh, Islamic nationalism uh, on the scene, the, probably with the collapse of uh, Pan-Arabism, you know, which in the 1970s. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, there's some historic reasons for that. Thank you. And if I could just ask you to expand maybe on what you mean by the connection between the collapse of the Labour Party and what that change meant to your mind. Yeah, um, uh, that's, a, that's a long story. But uh, yeah, I'd say that the, uh, the defeat of the Labour Party by uh, uh, Thatcher, the failure of their policies in the 1970s, the, uh, uh, the terrible economy. I lived as a kid in the 1970s in Britain. I, I could tell you it was a tough time. Those were days of lead. Um, the Labour Party was largely blamed for it. You think, uh, no, which of course brought about Thatcher, and then of course the events that happened during the 80s under Thatcher's uh, rule, uh, further erosion of British uh, Labour's uh, power, uh, namely the breaking of various unions, particularly the, the minor strike, is would probably be one event I'd point to, um, and then of course. Uh, uh, the reorganization of labor itself, you know, it became new labor and uh, the Blairites pushed out the uh, left-wingers, uh, there were uh, party purges, uh, and you have a new party, which is, I think is probably going to win the election, this upcoming election, but uh, it's certainly not the labor of the past. It might be pushed left, uh, as a, a friend was commenting to me earlier, by the Scottish National Party, but it's a, it's a shadow of what it was uh, in terms of its uh, ideology. Uh, the other thing to consider, by the way, about this group of writers, uh, they all think they're actually quite leftist. I mean, Rushdie does think of himself as a kind of, uh, well, probably left of the Labour Party. Uh, Martin Amis does, right? Uh, so same with uh, Ian McEwen. I mean, I think that's interesting, right? Because uh, I think we have the same thing in France, and probably even here, right? Thank you. Do we have time for one more question, please? Yeah, sure. I was just going to ask, um, this is going totally the other way. How much influence do you think writers like Jules Verne and H. Ryder Haggard and then yeah. even in the U.S., you know, Edgar Rice Burroughs, they mm -hmm. all had these kind of stereotypical representations mm -hmm. of particularly North Africa as a culture mm -hmm. and, you know, did that setting of the tone? Oh yeah, you name you name some of the great names. Uh, but I, again, I think the difference with them, and I, you know, they're with Hinty, right? Hinty is sort of my stand-in for the whole group. Uh, the difference is that first, all these references are simply there for adventure, right? It's 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 their vehicle for having a good time, um, you know, for the pleasure, right? Uh, I, I know this is very sort of fuzzy thinking, but my take is that. Uh, the vehicle then becomes the end itself. It's, in other words, that these representations, while disgraceful and racist and colonialist, uh, at least with regard to Islam, they're not about the very character of Islam itself, right? There's this sort of stand-in Islamic character, and let's have some fun, write a good story, a novel. It sells, 
you know, magazines and uh, actually a lot of consumables. The one thing you should know uh, is that the, basically the early 20th, late 19th, and early 20th century commodity economy had almost everything had some kind of uh, uh, orientalist uh, 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 relationship. Um, I'm a British football fan, and uh, you know, my team. Uh, now relegated to the conference, and Bristol Rovers uh, were uh, their original kit were called the, uh, uh, the the Black Arab kit, referring to the Sudanese modest army. Um, the Saracens are the Bristol uh, or, or a uh, rugby team. Um, so yeah, that's sort of my answer. I I I, I think that these the writers, particularly uh, writer Haggard, you mentioned, it's not about the nature of Islam or the prophet. I don't think it's the, the yes, the slurs are there, but they're not uh, intended in the same kind of sort of sectarian sense. That's not to say that they're not offensive. Thank you very much for your time, energy, and support. And I hope you will join us for further panels in tonight's keynote.